Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our, uh, I believe, uh, 11th session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya. And we have reached uh, verse number 46, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَئِن مَسَّتْهُمْ نَفْحَةٌ مِّنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّكَ لَيَقُولُنَّ يَا وَيْلَنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ And if but a breeze of your Lord's punishment were to touch them, they would surely say, O woe, woe unto us, truly we were wrongdoers. So far in the surah, as if you look at the verses that we've covered, the Prophet ﷺ has presented arguments for the oneness of God, arguments for, you know, uh, for the hereafter, for life after death. And the Mushrikeen, the Quraysh, they continue to reject. They are insolent, they are rebellious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here speaks about the consequences they will face in the hereafter as a result of their arrogance, as a result of their iniquities, their stubbornness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, now, you know, some of them may think that, okay, what's the big deal? We'll be punished in the hereafter. No big deal. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights, he underscores the severity of the punishment in the hellfire. And interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually speaks about the, the most minimal punishment in the hellfire. So here Allah says, وَلَئِن مَسَّتْهُمْ نَفْحَةٌ مِنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّكَ The word nafha I've translated as breeze, but that's really not, there's no word that really captures the meaning of nafha. Nafha is basically a cold wind. So here Allah is saying that if they were to touch, not, not go into the hellfire, just experience a single wind, a single whiff, the word nafha, means a cold, it's cold air, cold wind. The word nafha also is, in the Arabic language, we call it masdar marra, meaning a single breeze, a single wind. You know, for you have the word varaba, to hit, he hit, and then you have the word varba, which means a singular hit. So if they... If these disbelievers, the mushrikeen, those who are rejecting the truth and they're opposing the prophet, if they were to just, if they were to be touched by a single wind of the hellfire and the coldest wind in the hellfire, if it were to just pass and touch them, you know, sometimes when you open the oven and you get a, you get a taste, the hot air touches you. Here Allah is saying that if the coldest air, now here cold is relative, we're talking about Jahannam. If the coldest wind in Jahannam were to touch them, and the word mess is to very lightly touch. We have lems in Arabic, which means to touch, but mess means to very lightly touch. So again, If a single cold wind was to touch them min which is only from among the punishments of you're not Allah, min rabbik. So again, Allah is highlighting the fact that he is the caretaker, the sustainer. So Allah is essentially saying that if 
you were to just feel the coldest wind from the hellfire, what would be the reaction? What would be the reaction of the people? Layakulunna has double emphasis. So you have the word lam. So you know, usually it would say yakuluna. But here it's layakulunna. So the lam, the letter lam that is attached to the ya in the word layakulunna is for emphasis, lam tawkid. And then you have the noon at the end that has a shedda. So it essentially means that there are two letters, two noons. And that is noon al-thaqila, which is also there for emphasis. So there's double emphasis, meaning if the coldest wind, if a single breeze from the hellfire were to touch them, they would surely say, there's no doubt, undoubtedly they would say, woe be unto us. It's a very emphatic reaction. Ya waylana, and wail, according to some ahadith, is the worst part of hell. So Allah is saying that these people, before even entering, if a breeze, if the coldest air in Jahannam were to just graze them, just barely touch them, they would think they are in the worst part of hell. Allahu Akbar. They would surely say, woe be unto us, we were valimin, we were wrongdoers. And notice, they don't say, Inna kunna navlim, that we used to oppress. They describe themselves using a noun, not a verb. And the reason is because in the Arabic language, an ism, a noun, conveys the idea of permanence, meaning that vulm, wrongdoing, oppressing, is not just an action. They have done so much wrong that zulm has become a part of their nature. You know, sometimes you might do something bad, but you haven't done it enough where it becomes an established quality of the soul. So they say, Inna kunna valimin, that, that we were wrongdoers. We did so much wrong that zulm became a part of our essence. It became a fixed quality, an established quality of the soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, they may ridicule the Prophet now. They may not take this idea of the punishment in the hereafter seriously, but Allah says, you need to wake up. Because even the even the slightest exposure to the air, the coldest air of the hellfire will elicit a very intense reaction that you will think that you're in the worst part of hell. And this, you know, belittling, not taking the punishment of the hellfire seriously was not only specific to the Meccans, even Bani Israel, Bani Israel, who used to identify themselves as Sha'abullah al Mukhtar, the chosen nation of God. Now, even the wrongdoers, even the corrupt, even the sinful among the Israelites, they used to say that, listen, you know, yeah, we commit sins, we're corrupt, we do this and that, but. God loves us, and if he were to punish us in hell, it's only going to be for a few days. And Allah mentions this. You know, and, and you know, sometimes you have people who have this mentality. They think that, oh, you know, eventually all people are going to end up in paradise. So what's the big deal if I spend a few days or a few weeks in Jahannam? It's no big deal. And this was 
exactly what Bani Israel used to say in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 80, وَقَالُوا when they would be called out on their, on their corruption, وَقَالُوا لَن, لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا The children of Israel, at least the sinful ones among them, when they would be blamed for their behavior, for their immoral actions, they would say, the hellfire will only touch us for a few days. Meaning, we're not going to spend a lot of time in Jahannam, so it's no big deal. You know, it, it will end. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in ayah number 46, He says, don't take, don't think that, you know, it's something easy to endure, to be in hellfire for a few days. Allah says, وَلَئِن مَسَّتْهُمْ نَفْحَةٌ مِّنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّكَ If a single cold breeze or uh, the cold air of the hellfire touches them, it will elicit this, this, this sense of horror. It will be dreadful to them and they will blame themselves. They will feel as though they have entered into the worst part of the hellfire. In the next ayah, ayah number 47. So Allah now is speaking about the day of judgment. لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا وَإِنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We shall set the just scales for the day of resurrection. And no soul shall be wronged in the least. Even if it be the weight of a mustard seed, we shall bring it. And we suffice as reckoner. To understand this concept of mawazin, the idea of weighing our deeds on the day of judgment, I have to speak for a little bit. I have to give you a general overview of Yom Al Qiyamah. We have a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt السلام, that indicate that there are 50 stations on the Day of Judgment. There are 50 stages that we have to pass through until we are assigned our final abode. Now, the first station on the day of judgment <clears throat> is basically, and the Quran speaks about this, when people come out of their graves. Initially, you know, the Quran speaks about people coming out of their graves and everyone's going to look like scattered moths. We're just going to look like a scat sc scattered chaos. So when people come out of their graves, you can imagine the shock people will be completely bewildered, disoriented. And, and therefore, the first thing that will happen on the Day of Judgment when people come out of their graves is that the malaika will have to assign them, will have to take them to their appointed positions, meaning that the malaika will have to basically call people and drive them towards their appointed positions. Because people are essentially in a state of intoxication. They will be, you know, they will appear to be drunk, disoriented. So the malaika will have to kind of guide people to their respective positions on the day of judgment. Now, after this initial stage of disorientation and bewilderment, the Quran speaks about the idea of the books being opened, the opening of the books. Now, we have to remember that when the Quran speaks about the opening of the books, the opening of the book of our deeds on the Day of Judgment, we're not talking about physical books that are opening. The Quran is using figurative language. The opening of the books 
because if you're familiar with the ahadith literature that speak about the experience of the human soul in the grave that you know there's going to be questioning and there's there's an angel who will basically help us recall will will activate our spiritual memory and after this questioning and this recalling of our deeds in the grave the book of our deeds will be around our necks essentially what it means is our kitab will be attached to the soul it will be embedded in the soul you know it's kind of like when you have a file that needs to be unzipped so this kitab when we come out of our graves it's in a condensed form in our souls and this condensed kitab has to now be opened it has to be now be opened now when you think about deeds now i know this might get a little bit complicated but you will you will really appreciate the meaning of mizan if you understand this you see we have three main phases we have dunya we have barzakh and we have qiyamah our deeds our activities have different forms in these different phases so your deeds have a certain form in dunya you know your prayer your salah has a certain form in dunya bowing prostrating you see it in barzakh your deeds have a barzakhi form it has a barzakhi form it has a form it materializes in a way that is appropriate with that world now on the day of judgment deeds also have a qiyamati form now the opening of the books is basically the idea of converting the the barzakhi form of our deeds into their qiyamati form and that is the meaning of opening the books so you have deeds that are opened in alam al barzakh they have a certain form and then they are opened again in a more comprehensive way on the day of judgment so the opening of the books is essentially your deeds taking on a qiyamati form on the day of judgment this is what it means when we say the deeds are opened and this brings us to the next stage of qiyamah so again there are 50 and we don't really know all 50 stages but these are some of the main stations on the day of judgment and then you have arf where our deeds are are presented and displayed before god so the qiyamati form of our deeds are presented before allah now when people are confronted with their deeds and they see the qiyamati form of their deeds people are going to start arguing with god you know when you present evidence against people they try to you know to justify they try to argue they try to deny so there will be a phase on the day of judgment where people will deny they'll argue with god they'll blame others you know in the same way when when people are caught you know that's why they say you know prison is full of people who are innocent right because everyone is going to try to make the claim that they're innocent so people will blame others they'll disown people there's going to be a lot of argumentation they're not the people are not willing to own up to their deeds even though they have a qiyamati form which takes us to the next stage of qiyam which is the calling of witnesses and with our different types of witnesses our limbs will be witnesses against us the prophets the angels so there are different categories of witnesses and then you see that the Quran also speaks about the you know tatayr al kutub that once people are confronted the the books are returned and they are reattached to the owners meaning it's merged back into the soul and and by the way a copy of this book which represents our deeds 
is is based, there's a copy of it in those higher realms which will eventually become be translated and converted into paradise or uh, or hellfire now so people will 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 receive their book back it will be remerged into the soul and this is where uh, the hisab will begin. So we're, we haven't gotten to mizan. We're now we're at the the step right before the station right before hisab. Now hisab means accounting, and this is where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He mentions this in uh, in Surah uh, Al Inshiqaq. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِ so depending on how the, the soul is merged, if, if, if it's received in the right hand, and again, we really don't know the meaning of receiving the book in the right hand or receiving it behind your back. But the point is, this, is, this phase of accounting is, is where we're, we're going to be in dire need of Allah's mercy. This is where Allah pardons, He forgives. And this is where the hisab, the accounting can be easy or it can be difficult. And after this period of hisab, where God, you know, removes the sins, He pardons, this is where the individual takes his final form. Meaning that, that you, you witnessed your reality in the form of the books being opened. And now you're going through this phase of hisab. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive or overlook our sins. And therefore, the form, the form, the, the, the final form of the human being takes shape. So God deletes sins. There's a type of accounting that takes place. And then you have, now once the accounting, when the hisab finishes, when the accounting of human beings is over, and every human has assumed his final spiritual persona, his final form, it is at this time the soul, our, which is basically the deeds, our deeds are assessed for their true worth and value. So when we take our final form after the hisab, this is when we are essentially assessed and evaluated through something that the Quran calls the mizan. Because let's assume that you, know, you were forgiven. Now we have to know what is your worth? Where will you be placed in paradise? So mizan, mizan means, it literally means scale. And a scale is an instrument for measuring things. So the mizan on the day of judgment has a criterion against which the quantity and quality of our deeds, our amal, our morals, our akhlaq, our, and our beliefs will be evaluated. So our morals, our deeds, and our beliefs will be evaluated. Now, the wondrous feature of the Mizan is that it is able to register the amount of sincerity and truth contained within an individual's deeds. And some, and if you look at the verse, if we go back to ayah number 47, Allah says, We shall set the just scales. Mawazin is the plural of mizan. So there are multiple scales. And some say that every deed, every action that we perform will be measured according to different scales. So sometimes you might have one object and you measure its height. That's one scale of measurement. And then you measure its weight. And then you measure its mass. So one deed can have multiple scales. So I'll give you an example. 
when Allah Azza wa Jal wants to measure, when he wants to weigh our prayers, so the quantity of our prayers may be measured. How many prayers did you perform? So quantity. Secondly, the sincerity of our prayers is also registered and measured. So just because two people perform the same number of prayers, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're equal because quality of prayers is also measured. The, the punctuality of our prayers will also be measured. So you see that you have one deed, one prayer can be measured, can have multiple scales because you're measuring different dimensions of the act. Another opinion that is mentioned and of course these can all be correct some narrations indicate that these scales are the prophets and their successors whose deeds morals and teachings serve as the measure of sincerity and truth of the deeds of people so for example let's take the example of of chastity, of modesty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to measure our modesty. And let's say that, you know, you were living during the time of Yusuf and Yusuf was the prophet of the time. Allah will measure your hayat, your modesty. The criterion will be Yusuf. So your modesty will be measured against him. So he is basically the benchmark against which the virtue of, of modesty and bashfulness is going to be measured. So you see prophets are essentially the scales by which God measures people because they are the perfect standard. So for example, if you want to measure the height of something and you have to have a perfect criterion, so you have 24 inches, for example. Let's say 24 inches. Now, the only way that you can even measure any object is if you have something that is 24.00000 to, to the infinity. Because without that perfect 24.000 to infinity, you have no scale to measure. So the scales as inherent, they have to be, they necessarily have to be perfect. Because if you don't have that perfect figure, you have no standard of measurement. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so, and, and, and this idea of, of, prophets and their successors being scales against which the deeds of people are measured is even alluded to in some of the ziyarat that we recite. So for example, when we recite the ziyarat of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, one of his ziyarat, we say, As-salamu ala mizan al-a'mal. We say, peace be upon the scale of deeds. So the prophet, the imams, they are the benchmark. Right? And Allah measures the value of our deeds by how close we get to that benchmark. So the prophet has perfect akhlaq. Allah measures our prophet. The value of our akhlaq depends on how close our akhlaq are to the akhlaq of the prophet. The perfect prayer, for example, is the prayer of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Allah measures the value of our prayers, he measures it against the perfect prayer of, of Ali ibn Abi Talib or Rasulullah. And depending on how close you get, to that mark, that will dictate and determine the weight of that deed, the value of that deed. 
and therefore souls in general, they are assigned value and worth based on how closely they resemble the souls of the Ma'sumin, the souls of the prophets. So a soul that is filled with light, a noble soul is a soul that is more resemblant to the souls of the Anbiya and the successors. So that is the meaning of, that's one of the meanings of we shall set the just scales for the day of judgment, for the day of the resurrection. And Allah says, فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا Unlike other courts, this court, you know, even if you, even if we, you think about the Supreme Court, in this life, you know, in the United States, we have a Supreme Court. But there are many people who have been wronged, wrong judgments, unfair decrees have been issued by the Supreme Court. People have been wrong. They've been, you know, uh, uh, there was injustice. There have been miscarriages of justice in all the courts that we see. But on the day of judgment, Allah says, فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا Not even, you know, if we have a, a, a judicial system that is 99% accurate in its judgments, most people will, will be very pleased with that. Meaning 99% of the time, they are right. And only 1% are wrongly convicted. Believe me, BBC will do a documentary about how great this judicial system is. That out of, out of, out of all those who are incarcerated, only 1% are wrongly convicted. But on the day of judgment, Yom al qiyamah no one is wrongly convicted. The accuracy of that day, of that reckoning, is 100%. All of those who are in Jahannam deserve to be there. There is not a single soul. So out of the trillions of people that God has created, not a single soul will be wronged in the least. In the least. And then Allah says, وَإِن كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدًا Even if it be the weight of a mustard seed. Now Allah gives us a visual so we can kind of, we can understand the, uh, you know, this notion of God's absolute justice. You know, because we're visual learners. God says even that small little mustard seed Anything that is that small will not be overlooked. So you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about the hisab, when he speaks about the reckoning, that even if something is very minor, very insignificant, very trivial, it will be brought on that day. Whether it's good or evil. You know, sometimes we commit sins and we don't even realize it because we think it's so trivial. But what does Allah say in the Quran? Allah knows about even those treacherous glances. You know, sometimes you're not, you're just sitting there and you, you had an unlawful glance, just a glance. And you don't even think about it. You go out about your day, and if someone were to even bring it up to you later that day, you wouldn't even remember. But on that day, even those unlawful glances will be brought on that day, will be presented. And even those small good deeds that we perform that we might forget, we might think are insignificant, you know, that smile, when you, when you smiled in the face of your parents, you held that door for someone. You had that pure intention that never materialized. No matter what it is, Allah says, even if it is small, even if it is the weight, even if it be the weight of a mustard seed, we shall bring it. وَكَفَى bina hasibi, And we suffice, Allah says, we suffice as Reckoner. 
Allah doesn't miss anything. Everything is accounted for. I don't know if uh, let me let me continue with uh, this uh, the tafsir, and if I have time, I'll mention uh, this uh, this story. I'm not sure sure if I've mentioned it to this audience, but uh, I'll leave it to Brother Zain to remind me if we have time at the end. So the next uh, the next ayah, ayah number forty eight. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى وَهَارُونَ الْفُرْقَانِ وَضِيَاءً وَذِكْرًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Verse number 48, We indeed gave Moses and Aaron the criterion and a radiant light and a reminder for the God-conscious. In ayah number 48, Allah begins recounting the stories and the experiences of past prophets. And this is essentially why the story is called Surah Al-Anbiya. Now Allah is going to begin speaking about a number of prophets. Now, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا Again, وَلَقَدْ There is double emphasis there. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى We indeed gave Moses and Aaron Al-Furqan. We gave them Al-Furqan. Al-Furqan means the criterion. And Al-Furqan is an emphatic noun, which basically means the great distinguisher between what is true and what is false what is good and what is evil. You know, just like, you know, and many different words in the Arabic language, they have the same wazn, they have the same form, same pattern. So atshan means extremely thirsty. Atshan. You know, you have atash, thirst, and you have atshan, extremely thirsty. So al-furqan is something that very clearly distinguishes between truth and falsehood, between goodness and evil. And this is one of the adjectives that is given to the Torah. The Torah is a book which offers guidance. Its teachings allow you to clearly distinguish between what is true and what is false. What is right and what is wrong? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, and interestingly, you know, we know that Musa was the one upon whom the Torah was revealed. You know, if you remember, Musa goes to Mount Sinai and he leaves Harun behind. And Musa was the one who received the revelation. But here, Allah says, we gave Moses and Aaron Al-Furqan. Allah joins them together. So even though Harun did not receive the Torah directly, Allah makes him a partner in receiving that revelation because Musa made a dua and make him my partner in my affair. And similarly, you find that Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib are also paired together. You know, the Prophet used to say, Ya Ali satuqatil ala al-ta'wil kama qataltu ala tanzil Oh Ali, you will fight for the interpretation of the Qur'an just as I fought for the revelation, you know, to deliver the Qur'an to people. So because Harun had such an integral role in protecting the Torah, he is mentioned as being a recipient of the Torah. So there are three adjectives that are given to the Torah here. Number one, it is Al-Furqan. And Al-Furqan is it's a, it's a definite noun. It's ma'rifa, as our Arab uh, linguists would say, grammarians would point out that this is ma'rifa. It's a definite noun. 
because of the alif and lam, al furqan. And then Allah says what? He mentions two indefinite nouns after. Nakira. In Arabic, we call indefinite nouns nakira. Wadhiyaan. Wadhikran lil muttaqeen. This Torah that we gave to Musa, because if you recall, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 45 of this surah, you know, when you know the, when after the Prophet's being mocked and ridiculed, Allah tells the Prophet, say, I warn you through a revelation. Allah is telling the Prophet, have confidence in this revelation. And then Allah speaks to the Prophet about what he revealed to previous prophets, that they had confidence in their in the books that were revealed to them, and you should follow suit. You should have confidence in what has been revealed to you. The Torah is described as wadliya'an. The word liya is similar to the word nur, but there's a beautiful subtlety here. Nur means light in general terms. Liya is a very specific type of light whereby the light is inherent to that thing. So for example, when Allah, when he speaks about the sun and the moon, Surah Yunus, ayah number five, Surah 10, ayah number five, when Allah speaks about the sun and the moon, he says, he is the one who made the sun a radiant light, and he made the moon a light. Why does Allah call the sun Liya? Because not only does it possess light, but it is a source of light. The moon is a reflection of the light of the sun. So me, meaning that it acquires its light from the sun. Now in the world of spirituality, Allah, when he speaks about the Torah, he says that this book that I gave to Musa was the great distinguisher between truth and falsehood. And the reason why it's a definite noun, it's ma'rifah, is because this is clear to all people. Anyone who reads the Torah will find that this book clearly distinguishes truth from falsehood. But it is only a source of light and a reminder for the muttaqeen. And that's why ziyan Wadhikran are in the indefinite forms. They're indefinite nouns because they are specific to only a certain group of people, people of conscience, people who have taqwa. So if you look at even the way that these are ordered, so someone who comes to the Torah will find that it is, it is a book that clearly separates truth from falsehood. So imagine you're on a path and you reach a fork. You know, there's a fork. The, there are two paths. The end of the road. There's the fork at the end of the road. And you decide to take the path of truth. To continue on this journey, you need light, right? Because we live in a world of darkness. You need light to continue. So Torah has shown you the way. But to continue on this way, you need light. And when you are on the path of truth, shaitan will continue to try to throw you off. There will be obstacles even on the path of truth. And therefore Allah says, وَذِكْرَى And a reminder. Because shaitan will always try to make you heedless. So even, so Allah says, this Torah that was given to Musa and Harun, it is the criterion. And this is obvious to everybody. And it is a radiant light and a reminder, 
not for everyone, for those who surrender to it, who seek guidance from it. It is a radiant light and a reminder, a life-changing reminder lil muttaqin for those who are who have conscience who are searching for the truth and we mentioned this idea of there is a level of taqwa that can exist before iman before someone accepts the truth and there is a taqwa that follows uh, in the embracement of uh, the embracing of faith and then allah in the next ayah ayah number 49 he gives the tafsir of muttaqin. Who are these people who will benefit from the Torah? Who will, who will be the ones who will benefit from this liya'an wa dhikra? Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ so you need these two qualities. There are two qualities mentioned here. You need these two qualities for revelation to illuminate your soul and serve as a life-changing reminder. What are those two qualities? Who fear their Lord in the unseen. Now the word yakhshon, fear, doesn't do justice to the word yakhshon. Yakhshon comes from the word khushur. So there are two expressions that are used. The muttaqin are those who have khushur of their Lord when they are in the unseen, meaning when they are in private. Khushur is a type of fear that is coupled with a sense of reverence and great respect. Al-Khawf al-Muqtaran bil-ihtirami wa ta'zim. That they, they fear God, but that, it's not the fear that someone has of a tyrant or of a criminal. It's a type of fear where you are in awe of the majesty of God. It's a, it's a fear that is mixed with great reverence. And they have this in them even when they are alone. Even when no one is watching them, they feel the majestic presence of God. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you meet people who are non-Muslim who have this, this, this awareness of God. And these are the types of people that Allah gives tawfiq to. He allows them. At some point in their lives, Allah will, will enable them to benefit from the wisdom of revelation. And they are wary of the hour, meaning the day of resurrection, the day of judgment. So two things. They are aware of the presence of God they have this awe, this sense of reverence for God when they are alone, when no one sees them. And they are apprehensive. They are nervous about the day of judgment. And the word mushfiqoon is used. Mushfiqoon comes from the word al-ishfaq. And ishfaq is an interesting word because ishfaq is the feeling that it's the type of love and concern that parents have for their children. Parents worry, they worry, but that worry is also mixed in with love. So muttaqin are those who on one hand, they love the idea of the day of judgment. They are looking forward to meeting Allah. Because they, they, are, they want to meet their beloved. But at the same time, they're nervous. Because it's a very, they're nervous about how they will appear before God. 
You know, it, it's the same idea of a wedding day. A wedding, a wedding day is a happy occasion. But even though it's a happy occasion, the bride and the groom are still nervous because they want everything to go perfectly. They, they don't want a single mishap. You know, the bride doesn't want a single pimple on her face. The groom doesn't want any, you know, any blemish. They want to be perfect. And muttaqeen, they are mushfiqoon about the Day of Judgment. On the one hand, they, they love to meet God. But on the other hand, they're nervous about how they will be before Allah on the Day of Judgment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهَذَا ذِكْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ أَفَأَنْتُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ this, and I, I think we'll have to just leave this, uh, this verse for, uh, for next week, unfortunately. Yeah, I think we ran out of time. That verse needs a bit, a bit more time to, uh, to cover. So uh, with, that, with that said, uh, we can open up the, uh, the floor for questions and, uh, and answers if there are any. Uh, so um, you described... Uh, some of the stages of the Day of Judgment, but uh, you said there's 50. What happens in the other stages? So we don't know. The hadith don't give us details about the other stations. If you look at the, the Quran, if you look even at the hadith, we don't have detailed information about what occurs you know, at, at these different stages, these different phases of the Day of Judgment. And it's perhaps because it's beyond our comprehension. There are some things that we just, we won't understand until we're in that, in that realm. But some of, you know, some of the most important stations of, of Qiyamah are mentioned in the Quran and the Ahadith, at least the main ones. But the other, the others, they're, they're part of, you know, Alamul uh, Ghayb. Part of that unseen world, we just don't know. Okay. Also, in uh, verse forty-six, it's interesting that the people are well, when they're facing this uh, fire of hell, they are instead of crying out in fear of the fire, they're accusing themselves of saying, "Oh, we were zalimin." Instead of, "Oh no, it's fire up over there." Yeah. It, it's like if. Uh, it, it seems like they're drawing the cause and effect. It seems very immediate, apparent to them of between their actions. It's like if you, you cut yourself, you don't say, oh man, my thumb started to hurt. You say like, oh man, I cut myself. And exactly, exactly. And, and I think that this, this shows that they have finally come to the realization that, that hell, that what they are seeing is basically the manifestation of their own souls. So when they, when they see that suffering and that misery, they, they understand that Jahannam is not, it's not a separate phenomenon. It's not something that is separate from their souls. That what they are seeing is the, you know, as you know, the Qiyamah, not the Qiyamah form, but the, the, the manifestation of, of the reality of who they are. That's why they blame themselves because they created this. So it's not that they're being assigned some arbitrary punishment. You know, it's not like a, you know, a prisoner who goes into a small cell and complains that the cell, the prison cell is small. This is something totally different. The inmates of the hellfire understand very clearly that when they are experiencing the hell, this hellfire and the suffering, they know that they blame themselves because hell would not exist if it were not for the, their own corrupted souls. And how does this compare to uh, other verses of the Quran where it talks, where people say, oh, if you please just send us back to our previous life, we wouldn't do these things again but then they would like the Quran says that, but they would actually do it again if we were sent them back. Yeah. So what, what's your question? 
uh, how, how does this compare? Because this is like one idea of people are being fully aware of their own actions here in, in uh, this verse 46. But in other verses, I forget which surah has mentioned it, but there are other verses which cover it, where um, people would say that uh, that we are, like, if, if you please just send us back to our previous lives uh, on earth, we would not commit these evil actions anymore. There's, there's no contradiction between the two because... They understand that the only way for them to change their condition in the hereafter is to correct their amal. Well, so, well I think what, what I'm coming from is uh, those verses would end with, but if they were sent back, they would still keep doing their current deeds or their, their previous deeds. Yeah. They, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't change. You know, they, 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 might, they might think that they'll change, but Allah knows that they won't. You know, they, you know, they have kind of this idea that, oh, you know, I'll change, you know, in the same way that you might hope that you're going to be a certain way, but the result is the outcome is, is, is you're going to live up to who, who you've proven to be. So their hope that they, they, you know, to go back so they can behave differently is, is really a false, is a false hope. It's more like uh, some thinking, oh, I'll, I'll do better tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, there's a question, uh, what about shifat by the Prophet for their people? Uh, where will that work and will it have any weightage? So, so shafa'a will happen. Uh, so when we're speaking, so it's going to happen after. Uh, it seems that shafa'a will happen later on. That... Uh, I, do, I would have to look at the, the ayat and the ahadith to see exactly where shafa'a would... Uh, so, for example, we know that on the sirat, you know, there's going to be, uh, there's gonna be some, uh, some assistance. But it's exactly where does shafa'a uh, fall into, this, uh, into the, uh, the stations of the Day of Judgment? I would have to double check. Yeah, so, so for example, during the... Uh, you mean Christians and Jews who are living today? Uh, it doesn't specify, just to general Christians or Jews. So it, it, it depends. You know, if, if you're talking about the Bani Israel who lived during the time of Musa or lived during the time of Dawood and Suleiman, you know, each, each Ummah will have its own uh, intercessors. So Musa alayhi salam will be the Shafi'i. For his nation, and uh, and other pro other prophets will be you know shufa for their own nations. But uh, if you're talking about uh, those who are uh, who are uh, Christians and Jews today, again it depends. You know if uh, because the prophet you know uh, of Akhir zaman is is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa So the Christians and the Jews today. Their prophet is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa So it's not that they have they have more of a claim. You can't say that Musa or Isa have a claim to them. That this, you know, all of those alive today, if you accepted Isa and Musa, you have to accept the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa So whether or not they are worthy of uh, of intercession, it, it's a case by case. It depends, you know, how how much of the truth was delivered to them, you know, was Islam presented to them in an accurate way? If they rejected, what was the reason for their rejection? Was it because of arrogance or was it just because they didn't understand the, uh, the message or it was, it was misrepresented? You know, the, the, the point is that shafa'a will be avail available to people who are, who are worthy of it, you know, who are truth seekers, who, uh, who don't have this, this arrogance, who believe in Allah, who believe in the hereafter. So we can't really make, you know, sweeping statements about, you know, entire populations. You know, there, are, there might be some Muslims who don't receive the shafa'a of the Prophet. You know, so we, we, don't, uh, we don't know. When it comes to, because shafa'a is a dimension, intercession, it, you're talking about an aspect of Allah's rahmah. And we don't know who, uh, who will qualify for this intercession and who will be deprived of it.